Okay, so um, the next presentation is uh, by Noel and he's going to be presenting uh, random effects approaches to, uh, or state space, depending on what you like to use as a term, for modeling uh, landings and catch at age comps. Thank you, Mark. Uh, okay, so, well, the title's there. I'm at the, many, I don't know, uh, mo most of you actually, I'm a, a research scientist at the Marine Institute of uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland in the east coast of Canada. And I lead a, uh, a, a kind of a stock assessment or a quantitative fisheries ecosystems lab. Okay, so, uh, well, I'm, I imagine most of you are aware that catch at age data are derived from landings and uh, sampling information on the age compositions and uh, weights of fish. All of these have some uncertainty. So my, my, my idea is that the, well, the integrated assessment philosophy suggests we should uh, use different likelihoods for different data sources or data streams. Uh, and. Uh, a good thing about this is that it allows us to treat the uncertainty in the data sources uh, uh, differently. Um, so in this talk, I'm just going to uh, focus on how uh, my perspective on modeling uh, landings and, and age, age comps. So for quite a few of the stocks that I deal with, uh, we have little information on the accuracy of landings. But we have suspicions, and fishermen tell us anyway, that uh, they are under underreported, and there are various problems uh, uh, related to discards, area misreporting, and so on and so on. And the quality of the landings information changes over time. So, like historically, it may may be uh, like less precise than more recently, and so on. And like, for example, early NAFO landings were to some extent negotiated. So I don't even know if you can consider that data or not. I mean, it's a product of a, of a, of a meeting. Uh, and so the challenge then is in stock assessment. Well, how do we kind of model and, and, and account for the uncertainty in this type of uh, data? So I imagine the optimal solutions will be uh, case specific, but I'm just gonna quickly uh, describe the a kind of approach that I've been using. So the basic thing is the, you know, so the landings come uh, to us from a, a essentially a black box. I mean, it's, it's an enforcement monitoring program that, you know, the people don't like to talk about it. They have privacy concerns and whatnot. So we don't really get any information on the uncertainty uh, in landings, but so, I kind of, well, if, if no one will tell me about what, what the uncertainty in landings are, I'll just invent some bounds myself and I'll make them kind of wide. Uh, and then if people have better information to suggest they shouldn't be so wide, I'll be happy to use it. But if, if uh, and, and that's what happened uh, in this, oh, sorry. Uh, this is a kind of an illustration of it. Uh, so. Th so these, uh, the, the lower and upper black, bound, uh, black lines are kind of bounds on the possible landings that an assessment meeting agreed to. Uh, when I first did an assessment of this stock, I just invented my own bounds and they were quite a bit, well, actually, I used the bounds that Jonathan Babin had invented and they were quite wide. And so then, anyway, it kind of encouraged the meeting to come up with something else. Uh, I can't say I really agree with the bounds, uh, particularly how narrow they were back uh, historically, but anyway, this is what the meeting decided. So, so, th so the assessment model just gets the bounds. The bounds are the data. The, it doesn't actually see the landings at all. And how this comes in, it was, it's pretty simple. Uh, we use just a censored likelihood. So, you know, the likelihood is, is really the same as, as always. It's the log of a kind of a probability statement. And, and uh, we do set a kind of an assumed measurement error in, in range. It's supposed to be age, <laughs> but the, the, that just controls the sharpness of the bound. So here's an illustration of what the censored negative log likelihood would look like for uh, like if, if, for example, 
we were told the bounds in a particular year on landings were 20 to 30,000 tons and we could fix these. You, usually I choose like two, this Sigma L to be 0.02 and then that is what the censored likelihood would look like. So more or less flat between the bounds and increasing rapidly outside. So, so the stock assessment will want to keep predicted landings within the bounds. They can go outside a little bit, but not, not too much. And, and that's it. So we've been using that for several stocks and it seems to work, but I would be completely okay with other approaches. Uh, uh, the, the main thing I think we need assessment models in the future that can receive and use useful, usefully information on the accuracy of landings. Okay, move on to uh, uh, catch proportions or really any type of length or uh, compositional data. Uh, in, so it's often very difficult to evaluate from first principles the statistical properties of uh, catch at age. I mean, the, the, the sampling designs can be like really complex and poorly documented, change over time. And like some of the earlier sampling designs, we may not have information anymore. We may have lost, lost the, the input sampling. So, so and I know in, this has been a kind of an issue that Kaplan has looked at, I think, in, in past workshops, this data waiting workshop, I think it was, uh, so, uh, Although this Francis paper may have predated the, it was, right, okay, so, so there were several papers published on this in, you know, around this 2014 time. So uh, Francis concluded that the logistic normal multinomial distribution, which I'm not, you know, WAM is using something like that. Is it, where is he gone? Yeah, do you, do you know what? It, there's a couple of these. Uh, okay, we'll ask him, yeah. Okay, no, no trouble, yeah. So, so this logistic normal multinomial distribution, uh, Francis thought in 2014, it showed great promise. This is uh, within the compositional data analysis world, they call this the additive logistic transformation. Um, this, you know, and this guy, Atkinson, wrote the book on this sort of thing. Well, 2003 the book was. So he, he argued for, comp for ordered compositional data like lengths or ages. He felt like uh, there was a, um, this multiplicative logistic transformation was mo more appropriate. So I'm just gonna quickly look at the differences in the two approaches. And well, that's the multiplicative one. Uh, Jonathan Babin described that in his talk. Um, you know, just it's a transformation. We don't have to worry about the details. So I'm just going to test that very quickly using some uh, like random data uh, generated from a Dirichlet distribution, which is pretty much the simplest kind of distribution and correlation structure you could imagine for compositional data. Uh, so these are the properties of the uh, Dirichlet data. So I generated a, a very large data set, like 10,000 years of uh, random samples from the Dirichlet distribution and just compute their correlation. And this is a, a kind of a, depicts the correlation structure. And it's just all as expected, right? The, the, the math is right here. The, so, so that's great. Yeah, our Dirichlet works, exactly. So then I applied the, this additive logistic transformation to the 10,000 samples and computed the uh, correlation structure. And, uh, you know, I like, in hindsight, this makes sense, but I was quite surprised at the time. Uh, there's large kind of correlations that, that you know, I think uh, will be a problem. So then I, well, I just did it again. There was a, a very small catch proportion. That was a one in the first data generator. So I replaced it with a 10 and, you know, same thing. We get these large correlations. Uh, so, so this, I think, will be a problem for using this approach in stock assessment model. Uh, uh, you know, we're going to, you're going to need the, the account for that correlation structure somehow in the observation equation. And I think it's gonna get, get really messy. So, 
So I, my, my advice is that this additive logistic multivariate normal approach to go in the next gen trash bin. I, you know, just based on some pretty simple heuristics, I, I think there's, it's going to be more trouble than it's worth. So then I looked at the, the multiplicative logistic normal and that behaves, you know, much, much, that behaves nicely. It's essentially uh, produces uncorrelated. Uh, the, the, these are this, what's, what, what are called the continuation ratio, logit transformation of the, of the proportions. So the CRLs are, are independent in the Dursele case, which is, is nice. And same with the, you know, two cases, both are independent. So this is now uh, like a transformation that we could apply to age comps and, and, and maybe get some, somewhere with. So, uh, so the, you know, we can expect, we can hope for possibly more simple correlation structures and CRLs. I mean, this is why in, in the state-based model I did for uh, Northern Cod in 2016, is why I used the multiplicative one. Uh, Divya Varkia and et al. used it, probably because I did. I don't know if she really thought about it, but. You know, so it's been used a couple of times, but uh, uh, as, as Anders had mentioned, they, they disagree with uh, this approach. So there's a paper on that. Uh, so, so, you know, that, that's it. You, no one ever agreed. Everyone is never gonna agree with you, so. Uh, but some issues I see uh, with, with this type of approach, is, you know, what do you do if you have zeros in your compositions? If the, the CRL uh, is not defined for zeros. Plus, it doesn't use uh, information on the age comp sample sizes, which somehow seems to be important. But, you know, my perspective anyway, this type of an approach is a possible, say, next-gen option for fitting compositional data, particularly for that type of data where you really don't know what the input sample sizes are. Uh, so a little bit on how we we'll have to do with input, input sample sizes. I just thought that the, the first considered like a ridiculously simple situation where say you could, uh, you know, you knew that you could store every fish that was going to be caught by, by the fishery and, and uh, like randomly sample uh, a, a, a subset of the entire catch for aging. Then You'd expect then, if you could really completely random sample the entire catch, that the, the catch composition, which I have somewhere yeah, up here, should have an approximate, approximate Poisson distribution. And like in this case, statistical theory kind of indicates that the, the relevant distribution to be using for inferences about the catch proportions would be the, the multinomial. So I, I, you know, I don't think there's too much debate about that. However, even if there's a slight bit of over dispersion coming in, like, uh, you know, I just looked at this, well, Anders kind of uh, looked at this Poisson gamma mixture model, which is negative binomial. But even in that sim with that simple type of uh, kind of over dispersion, uh, it, we start to get in trouble because the separation of information about the proportions in the conditional distribution uh, no longer exists. And, uh, you know, the distribution, the conditional distribution, of your, the, the distribution of your catch composition, conditional on the total, uh, is, a, is a difficult distribution. And for example, uh, in, in that situation, which is negative binomial counts, it's no longer the case that the, the sample proportion is, is not unbiased for the population proportion. So that's... And the bias is compl complicated. It depends on the over dispersion and the sample size. It's, it's a real mess. But the gist of what's going on is that this over dispersion acts like covariate measurement error in linear regressions. So that you're getting, you're getting what's called bias attenuation. So you overestimate small proportions and underestimate large proportions. Uh, and large sample sizes, you know, will we'll never remove that type of bias. I mean, you're stuck with it, but, but it might not be substantial, but it's just a complication I thought I'd mention. 
Okay, now on to a more realistic genera generating mechaniz mechanism for, uh, uh, say, you know, samples of uh, age frequencies from catches. Uh, so, look, I just take the log of the uh, of this, and, and you know, so I can write the log catch at age from your your sample as uh, like the overall sample size effect plus the log of the proportion plus this log gamma. So that log gamma is like is acting like an error term. Like if we think it's it has a gamma distribution with mean one, then the expected value of the the log of that is approximately zero. So the log ga oh, oh, sorry the log gamma distribution is approximately like a normal distribution. So in any event, we can think of the log gammas as additive additive error terms, and we could consider that the you know the the set of log log gammas has a multivariate normal distribution with some correlation structure. And that's the log Gaussian Cox process. Uh, so, so then, uh, you know, we could form this uh, uh, distribution for the counts. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to work with the sample proportions, uh, uh, but it's, it's the same thing as working with the actual counts. You know, conditional on those over dispersion parameters, these random effects, these gamma random effects. This has a, mul a multinomial distribution. And, uh, and then we could uh, uh, get the marginal distribution. You're not gonna do that like analytically, but we can easily use TMB to do that. And so we can uh, uh, and apply basically a conditional log Gaussian Cox process for, for inferences about the catch proportions. And this, this uh, condition first and marginal is, well, uh, is technically wrong, but useful. The technically right thing is to marginal, get the marginal distribution, then condition, but that's less useful. We could talk offline about that. Um, I tried to do the right thing first and didn't get anywhere. Uh, yeah, so this conditional log Gauss, uh, you know, this, Conditional log Gaussian Cox process is, is different from a multinomial or Dirichlet multinomial, both in uh, uh, variance and variance structure and correlations. So with this conditional type approach, you don't have to have all negative correlations between composition bins like the multinomial and, and Dirichlet multinomial has. And, and as Anders pointed out, I think in stock assessment, this is the problem with using uh, 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 like it's your data will usually be correlated positively correlated across length bins or a, or if you have a lot of ages across a, age bins and when you use a misspecified model like the multinomial or Dirichlet multinomial it kicks it creates lots of lack of fit and the models get really really focused on fitting that data as well as possible to try to get rid of the lack of fit and so that's, and then, you know, we kind of think it's getting too much weight. So like I illustrate this, this correlation structure. So, you know, I went through the same process, generated a large number of random samples from this distribution and got the, but, it, you know, so what I'm going to do is model these uh, log gabins as multivariate normal. But the first case I'll, I'll consider when they're independent, have no correlation. That's this case. But it's interesting, even here, just with Poisson over dispersion, the, uh, the correlation structure, the log Gaussian, correla log, log Gaussian Cox process correlation structure looks quite a bit different than multinomial or Dirichlet multinomial. Dirichlet multinomial, you're only scaling the uh, kind of multinomial type variance. So that's uh, with, but you know you can create correlation structure quite easily. So this is the type of correlation structure for compositional data that I think we could be entertaining for stock assessment purposes. So that uh, uh, you know adjacent ages or length bins or whatever are correlated. But of course it's compositional data, so there has to be negative and positive correlations. The sum, at, you know, the sum of the proportions has to be one. So, uh, yeah, we could also, well, we don't have, we, you know, this conditional log, we could use the log Gaussian Cox process directly, not bother with the conditioning, but then you're going to end up with a, a lambda parameter for every kind of compositional sample you have, which 
that creates some problems too. Uh, one thing I've been looking at is what happens when you get when our guess about the sample size is wrong because it's really kind of tough to know what the, the, the sample size actually means in, in this sort of thing because the highly complex sampling design. So I've been doing some simulations where I kind of generate data one way and fit with a different sample size. Uh, so here's a, a situation. Uh, yeah, so I generated uh, data. I guess this was with the uh, correlated kind of random effects in, in the, in the, and uh, generated data with a total sample size of 250 and fit assume, with an assumed sample size of 50. And we got MSEs here and the, log, the conditional log Gaussian Cox processes here is doing better. It does quite a bit better in terms of bias. The little inset figures here are what would, are the results when uh, the model is properly specified. So when my assumed sample size equals to the true one. So, so uh, uh, yeah, so it's working a bit better. So this is my final slide. So just some conclusions from my perspective on, on this. Uh, we sh next generation stock assessment models should have the ability to include taken as inputs uncertainty in the landings uh, data. And of course, use it usefully. <laughs> it's easy to have any model read in <laughs> uncertainty, but it should have some useful effect. Uh, see, it, with this conditional log Gaussian Cox process, it seems better to fix age comp sample size too low. Like if you're not really sure what the, what the effective or the effective sample size is, you're better to guess too low than too high. Uh, I would say a preliminary result was, he, he, you know, I didn't do anything with this additive logistic uh, normal transfer, transformation, but even the CRL approach didn't actually work too well in the, in these um, log Gaussian Cox process simulations. All of this needs testing within stock assessment, within some assessment model frameworks. But from my perspective, I think this additive logistic multivariate normal and also the, the, the multinomial and Dirichlet multinomial should probably enter the next gen trash bin in terms of fitting length and age composition data. I don't think it's really, yeah, you know, we might want to have the options there, but the next gen models should certainly include better options th than those. Thank you. So does anyone have any questions for Noel? Yeah, um, Jim. Thanks, Noel. I just wonder if you had any thoughts about robustness and the other question was um, feelings on downweighting composition data as a general principle. Um, I feel like sometimes we downweight things inappropriately and so robustness, uh, yeah, it's, it's important. <laughs> uh, do you mean have I examined the robustness of? I guess just are, the, are these likelihoods by definition more robust than others or are there ones that are, I'm thinking mostly of ones that like Fournier developed years ago and. For the compositional data, I think that was the, was that the additive logistic? No, the robust number. Oh, a robust. Oh, you're just talking about, oh, for model fitting, yeah, sure. If you, you know, so if I'm fitting and uh, see some really wonky residuals, I might contemplate using a T distribution or something. T with low degrees of freedom. And that's, an, that's Anders trick and I use it to. to there, there is a, in SAM, for, even for a, like, like you have a multivariate normal distribution, there's a multivariate mixed distribution where you can set, say, 5% T3 or something. For multivariate, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so there are various ways you could robustify things. I mean, you can't use the kind of traditional bounded influence robust approaches in TMB because it breaks the auto dip. Uh, they're not smooth functions. Uh, the, yeah, so that's an issue, uh, but. Uh, or, or an ADMB. Yeah. Or an ADMB, yeah, any, because it's not a smooth. Uh, 
So robustness is important for sure. And what was your other question? Uh, just on, on the actual specification of input sample sizes relative to index values. And well, I actually don't use this approach. Uh, uh, I, I'm just using the CRL approach and just not have not use sample size at all, but I'm not happy about it. But we just can't get any information on age or length comp composition sample sizes out of DFO. They don't tend to, be, and they have not even stored that, archived that information very well. So it's kind of difficult to re reconstruct it. They can, but so uh, uh, yeah, well, the simulation simulations I was doing it suggest that you should, uh, you know, err on the low side of the input sample size. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I've got a question. What about zeros? Do all yeah. of these methods deal with zeros? Oh yeah, the, 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 the conditional, problems? that's why I started looking at the conditional, the log Gaussian Cox process that can handle zeros. The, 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 the methods for compositional data don't, I mean, and if you read their literature, they suggest replacing zeros with small values and that, that kind of never really seems to, work, especially uh, for some of the stocks. I mean, like Northern Cod, if you look at the age comps of the, the, the catch at age, there's a, a V of zeros in around the time that thing collapsed. I mean, I don't think we want to be replacing them by 0.01s or whatever, like, so. Yeah, Brian, I think, yeah. Uh, when I said that WAM has seven options for the age comp, four of them are logistic normal with different ways of dealing with zeros. Yeah, so you add the zeros, but, and if you only have one or two zeros, perhaps it's not gonna be a tremendous issue, but if you have a, a lot of them or if they're appearing in a, in a structured manner, then uh, I think replacement options are, are not so good. Any, any other comments or questions? Okay, thanks, Noel.